Well, welcome. This, I'm Carol Ronnebaum, the Seniors Real Estate Specialist with Coldwell Banker American Home. And today we are joined with uh, Kansas Palliative Care and Hospice ladies. So welcome. Uh, we have Ashley and Lori uh, here with us today. Um, thank you for coming. Thank, thank you, you for having us. us. Thanks. Thanks. So. <laughs> Um, well, I feel comfortable taking the mask off. We're filming this during the COVID. Do you, do you ladies feel comfortable? Sure. Absolutely. Awesome. Let's do that. Okay. All righty. Well, Ashley, um, share with us, uh, first of all, what is hospice? Hospice is a service or a benefit that anybody that suffers from a life-limiting medical condition qualifies for. The hospice benefit is a benefit that all people have earned all of their life, but they don't really realize the um, different types of hospices or what different agencies um, have to offer. Oh, and it's for people that are no longer seeking aggressive treatment or their life-limiting medical condition is not something that is going to um, necessarily ever get better. Okay, well, super. Um, Lori, can you share with us what palliative care is? Yeah, so palliative care is kind of the stepping stone before hospice. So oh. palliative is for anyone that is still fighting the good fight, getting aggressive treatment. So it can be for anyone that has um, cancer and they're still getting chemo or radiation. Our team would come in and start helping with those services ahead of time. That way when they transition to hospice, they already know our team and they're already comfortable with everyone on the team. Sure. Um, it is a little bit different than hospice. It's not as robust as hospice is, um, but they do still get quite a bit of support given to them. But yeah, and it could be for someone who is, um, you know, hospice appropriate, but not hospice minded yet. And so we try really hard to provide that emotional support on palliative as well and that continued education of why hospice is so important. Okay. And it's free with our agency, it's free. We don't bill for it. Oh, okay. So that's the beauty of it. Okay. And I hear the word respite care. Um, respite. Is that something that you provide as well? Respite is not something that we provide, um, but respite is a service. Um, an example of respite would be like if somebody was living in the home and the wife was taking care of that loved one and was tired or needed a break. So there's a service or sometimes they can put them somewhere on a temporary basis, um, anywhere between two days and two weeks. They can kind of get a little bit of a, a break Why from so caring for, for the, the twenty. Caregiver. Yeah, it's for the caregiver. Yeah, and that's a Medicare part of the Medicare benefit. So we don't provide that twenty four hour respite in the home, but we do provide that service as far as helping facilitate to get a respite stay done. Right. Um, oh, okay. The typical time for that is five days is normally the respite period that Medicare allows. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, like Ashley said, that's for caregivers who want to go on a cruise or just need a break and we can help get them moved into a facility temporarily until they feel up to going back home. And our agency does have a awesome volunteer coordinator who is a past veteran. Uh, she's retired and she facilitates the volunteer process where we can go into the home and provide a couple hours of breaks or respite care from the, on the hospice benefit. Um, right now, COVID is not, Medicare is not allowing us necessarily to provide that, but we are working on reintegrating those um, services and processes into our patients. Okay, well, good. You know, many times we hear uh, hospice, that people go on hospice maybe the last two or three weeks, if that long, of their lives. Is is that normal, or when does when is a patient eligible for those types? So, of services? Um, our goal of what we do in the area is we are out hitting the pavement every day to educate doctors, social workers, families that hospice has changed so much over the years. Where you know, back in the eighties and nineties when it started, that that's what hospice was for to come in at truly end of life. Um, I like to say that Medicare kind of got smart and realized that that's the one good thing in my opinion that Medicare has done is provide hospice a lot sooner to people. So what we try to do is um, just teach and educate people the early adoption theory. Um, and so the the national average length of stay is about 57 days on hospice care. Oh, it is. Um, our agency is mm -hmm. about 125 days. Wow. Yeah. Um, and so we 
have a list of you know possible qualifying things that go on so even if someone doesn't have a terminal illness some people say well i don't qualify because i don't have cancer well if they've lost 20 pounds in two months they more than likely qualify for hospice mm -hmm. so there's different things we educate on um, because someone can be on hospice for two years we just don't know My goodness. and so our job is to kind of document the decline that's going on and show medicare you know they're they are you know still overall healthy but there is still some decline going on so we can keep them on our service mm -hmm. okay. okay well good um I hear. I like to add to that too. Sometimes um, people think hospice, they have the stigma behind it. That means that they're going to die or there's an yes. end of life or six months or less to live is, is the mentality of most people when they think of the word hospice. Mm -hmm. That's not necessarily true. Like Laura said, we continue every day to educate, but that's not necessarily the case. Um, we've had to, our agency in particular, has had to discharge people off of service, off of hospice services because they got better, not worse in this area. Oh so it doesn't goodness. necessarily mean that they're going to die or that they are at end of life. Mm -hmm. um, it just means we weren't able to continue to bill Medicare and show decline because they got better. And then therefore that benefit period will end and then we can then bring them back on service when appropriate, when we can show that they are de back to declining again. Okay. Oh my goodness. So I bet a lot of people have not ever heard so of that. So a lot of flexibility, a yeah. lot of flexibility, and we have to continue to show decline, emergency room visits, frequent UTIs, uncontrolled pain management. Um, any, there's lots of different things that you can put a patient or keep a patient on hospice for. It doesn't necessarily mean that they're terminally actively going to die. Okay. Well, that's yeah. great information. We have one patient. He's been on service for 631 days. My goodness. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's, that's in, so in a area. lot for your services mm -hmm. that you're able to, mm -hmm. to be with him and, and help them through, you know, their life and, and it's an additional service to, health. Yeah, so it's the additional service in coincide in addition to what they're currently getting. So if they're in a nursing home, they're getting that skilled care or that or that you know level of care every day. But then we can come in and add to that. Sure. And with that hospice team, you get myself, you get an RN case manager, a hospice aide, a social worker, and a chaplain. So you get five people, oh, okay. you know, surrounding care. Wonderful. Good. Good. What are um, some of the misconceptions, uh, others' misconceptions that uh, you ran into in your groups? So a lot of what Laura and I just mentioned with the end of life or what that looks like, that's a misconception. A lot of people don't realize that they think that if they have cancer, then they're hospice appropriate, but there's lots of different life-limiting medical conditions like dementia, Alzheimer's, COPD, heart, stroke, there's several different things. Cancer obviously is probably the one that people understand or hear the most about, but there's lots of different types of things that people suffer from that they don't realize would make them hospice appropriate. Okay. Um, and a lot of times it's called dementia, but that could be considered senile degeneration of the brain as an actual diagnosis. They're just not remembering people, their loved ones or caregivers. They don't know where they are. They don't know who the president is. So lots of people see that very common change and go, I really think my mom or my dad or my brother or my sister are declining because they're just not able to recognize the people that they used to recognize. So there's lots of things to be looking for um, with hospice indicators or life-limiting medical conditions that would qualify them. Okay. Yeah, another thing I hear a lot is that um, hospice comes in and takes everyone off their medications mm -hmm. and waits for them to pass. Or maybe won't allow them to eat. Yes. I've heard that as well. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, it's actually quite the opposite. So Medicare allows us to provide them all the medications they need related to comfort. So nausea, constipation, vomiting, diarrhea, all of that stuff is covered, pain. And so if our nurse comes in and they're already on some medications, but maybe they're still in some pain, She'll call our medical director, get a new order for a different pain medicine. Our pharmacy delivers it right to their front door. Oh. Um, and another misconception is about any wounds. So a lot of times if someone has a really bad wound, um, the perception is why would we try to heal it because it's they're, they're passing away anyway. Mm -hmm. 
um, we don't want anyone to be uncomfortable at all. Oh, sure. And so I think that can get kind of skewed with different companies as well because wound care honestly is pretty expensive. Um, but that kind of goes behind our faith-based Christian principles of what our owners have, that we just do the right thing no matter how much it costs. Um, and so we do strive to heal wounds. Um, we might not have enough time by the time we get the patient to actually heal the wound, but mm -hmm. we do have a very good wound program for that. Um, another misconception I commonly hear, because I think a lot of people have this misconception because that's the last medication they gave mom or dad is morphine is mm -hmm. what kills people. Not true either. Right. <laughs> um, you know, there's different types of liquid pain medicine that we can administer to them when they are in uncontrolled pain. Morphine's just the most common one. Oh, um, and so I think a lot of people feel like, I wish I wouldn't have given my mom or dad that because I think that's what, you know, mm -hmm. made them pass away. But in all reality, it's, you know, your, the body's going to shut down whether there's pain medicine involved or not. And so our job is to make that as easy and comfortable and have as much dignity as possible to the patient. Another one I've experienced is, um, well, I have to go into a nursing home. I can't be in my home. We'll follow you anywhere you go. So if you're in a nursing home and you want to go home because of COVID or whatever that may look like, we'll follow you wherever you go. Um, if you go to the hospital, say you fall and you break your hip and you're on hospice, the nurse comes out, we have 24-7 care, we find out that that patient has a fractured hip, we're not going to not send our patient to the hospital to get the hip fracture fixed. Like, we're gonna say, yes, that's what we feel you need to do. They'll get their hip fracture fixed and then we'll bring them back on service once they get back into the home and they're discharged. So the other thing that I've ran into is patients will say, I wanna see my favorite son or my grandson be or I die on hospice, I've been told I can't go anywhere, I can't travel, I can't leave, that's not necessarily the case. We want you to live your best life. We want you to go and do what you feel you can go and do. Mm -hmm. We're not gonna tell you just because you're on hospice that you can't go on vacation or you can't see your loved ones. So we will. You, we just wanna be notified that you're on vacation and that you're not home and that you can't see that favorite person or so you can see that favorite person and we'll resume your visits when you get back. Wonderful. We want you to live your very best life. Okay. And again, foods aren't withheld. No, no. no. It's all comfort feeding. So there's a lot of times where we actually have a, a patient in a facility right now, and our nurse takes him a cheeseburger and french fries every time she goes and sees him because oh, that's okay. what he wants. Uh -huh. um, although he technically has like a mechanical soft diet because he can't swallow very well, but that's something that is patient choice once they're on hospice. It's always patient choice anyway. Um, That's good to know. I work, I was in the facility background for eight years. Um, and so, you know, we could always recommend, well, you're diabetic, you can't have, you shouldn't have that, but it ultimately it's their choice. Okay. Um, and so that just is even more understanding on the hospice side where, you know, if they just want a cheeseburger, it's, they're tired it's of eating. It's part of comfort. Sure. It's part of comfort. Mm -hmm. Comfort care. Yep. Part of comfort. Yes. Yep. Well, that's, that's great information to be getting out there to the general public because so many misconceptions. A lot. Uh, a lot yeah, more bad that than surrounds good. hospice. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. And so, again, uh, hospice care and palliative care, are they both covered by Medicare? So, palliative care is free. So when you're on palliative care, we're not going to bill. You're going to continue to, to do everything that you've normally been doing. You're going to take your normal medications. You're going to go to your normal doctor. If that's a pulmonologist, a heart doctor, cardiologist, a PCP, whatever that may look like, we're not going to come in and we're not going to change anything. You're te technically not even really our patient. We're just an advocate. We're just a comfort layer. We're just an additional set of eyes and ears to what you're currently doing. Oh. If you're on hospice, then you are a patient. You will have Dr. Hansen, who is our medical director, mm -hmm. provide all of your medical equipment, all of your meds, all of your cares, write all the orders, and we'll be giving generalized um, care to you. We'll provide your anxiety medication, depression medication. If you have a UTI, we'll test you for a UTI through your urine, and we'll provide you an antibiotic if you need it. We will give your all around general care. You will no longer go to your cardiologist. You will no longer go to your pulmonologist. You'll never never need to see your PCP again. Like we are your all in one care for everything. 
everything. So you don't even need to leave your home because your medical equipment and your pain medications or whatever medications are prescribed to you will be dropped off at your door, ordered to you by us. Medical equipment meaning beds? And beds, commodes, Hoyer lifts, shower bars, elbow pads, incontinence supplies, bathing supplies, mouth care, Glucerna or Ensure if you need a drink, like the protein drinks, we provide all of that wow. paid for by our agency and delivered to your home. My goodness. What, yeah, what and a, that, that medical service. equipment and supplies are Bro part of that Medicare benefit that's broke down, covered. delivered to your door in pieces, put together in front of you, and then we help you you know get educated. The nursing team helps you get educated on how to use those, Wonderful. those tools. Wonderful. And then when they're no longer needed? They can be donated by the patient or the caregiver or family to a church or to another oh, right? another place. Yeah. We can't take it back. Oh, okay. But yeah, if it's something they bought already, um, you know, if, if someone has already purchased a hospital bed so they don't want our medical equipment company to bring it, then they're welcome to donate it or whatever they want to do with it. Um, otherwise, if it's through our medical company that supplies it, then we just pick things up and bring things out as they need it or don't need it anymore. If they're on oxygen, oh, wow. then mm -hmm. we have the oxygen company come and get their oxygen and we have our contracted company bring the oxygen out. Oh, or if they're renting a bed or renting a wheelchair or renting any type of equipment, we will have them come and pick up the equipment so they no longer have to pay for it as it's covered under their hospice benefit for free. Wow. So we can save them money. Wow. Well, hospice uh, certainly to me sounds like a, a a service that we all deserve mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and should be taking advantage of. Yes, mm -hmm. uh, as as needed. Forty nine point five percent. Forty nine point six. Forty nine point six percent people die without their hospice benefit. Oh my goodness, I hate hearing that. Yeah, so a lot of people don't know, um, and sometimes they wait too long. Um, there's a lot of people, obviously now with COVID, but before COVID, there was a lot of people, you know, passing away in the hospitals, and so. Our goal is to just educate them and show them that we can take care of you at home. We can help you get back home and set everything up for you, and then you can look out and watch your dogs play in the backyard. You don't have to be in the hospital. We can help. If the outcome is going to be the same no matter what, you may as well be at home. Right. And you may not need the hospital bed or the commode or those, those items at the time that we admit you, but you can always call us later, and we'll have them delivered as you need them. Wonderful. There's some people that are on hospice that are still walking, still trying to mow their yard, still trying to weed whack, still trying to shovel the snow in the winter time. So obviously we're, you know, not like, oh yeah, get out there and mow that yard, but we're obviously <laughs> not gonna not support that. Keep either. them from doing yeah. that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what wonderful information. Thank you so much for coming and sharing all this great information yeah. and, and uh, uh, with the, pub, the public here. Um, why don't you go ahead and tell us again your names and your contact information, your company's uh, name, and so people will know how to reach out to you. And we can tell you three or four things of why we're different from other hospice agencies in this <laughs> I would love that. I would love to tell you. Yes, please do. So I'm Ashley Dillow, I'm Community Relations for Topeka Lawrence, and uh, 60 miles outside, and I also blend into uh, Bonner, Baser, Tonganoxy. Oh, wow. Love in North Lansing, and she gets around. I guess. In a good way. I gave up DeSoto, so I was going to say DeSoto, but I don't get DeSoto anymore. Um, and go ahead, Laura. I'm Laura Thoden. I'm the Community Relations Manager for Kansas Palliative and Hospice Care. So I am in the metro area um, with the other Community Relations team down there, and then I come up here uh, once a week to spend time with Ashley. Well, wonderful. So share with us. So we're faith-based. We're locally owned. Um, and we also have a, what now, level five? Almost. Almost We're level five uh, veterans program. We have a WE Veterans program. So the benefit to being a veteran on our hospice services are um, we give all of our veterans and their loved ones a flag for free. It's delivered to wherever the patient may be. Um, if COVID wasn't a thing and we had a volunteer be able to, we like to set our mail um, veterans with our male veteran patients and vice versa so they can share 
um, those war stories or whatever their, you know, awesome experiences, what their branches and what, you know, their, sure. their special stories about being a veteran. We have contracts with the Kansas City VA, the Leavenworth VA, the Topeka VA. Did I miss anywhere? Nope. So we service them. Um, and then we also do what's called a stand down. And I'll uh, let Laura explain that because she explains it way better than I do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we do a stand down for um, patients that might, you know, a lot of times we've realized with the extra training that the nurses have gone through to learn the emotional and physical side effects of the wars that they've been in that sometimes they feel like they can't let go yet. Um, and so Jamie is our volunteer coordinator who's also a combat veteran herself. And so she does a stand down little ceremony for them to relieve them of their duties and let them know, you know, all the great things. You did an amazing job keeping America free and we appreciate everything you've done, you know, and it's, your family's okay with you going, you can go. And um, oh, wow. she also found a volunteer that can um, write memoirs out and so that's been really helpful emotionally for our families to know, even if it's after their spouse passes away, what they were kind of going through, because a lot of times they don't want to talk about it. They don't want to share. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. What a wonderful thing. Oh, my goodness. So we're doing like a veterans penning on the 11th, where we're going to a facility where we're penning. She's penning veterans. We have actual certificates for all the veterans. Um, there's just special things. We have red veteran shirts that we wear every Friday. We've got those two months ago leading up to the Veterans Day. Mm -hmm. We're very big. And yeah, Veterans Day is, or Veterans Day and the veteran program in general is really big for us because, um, like Ashley said, we're locally owned and one of our owners is a veteran himself as well. Right. Um, mm -hmm. And so even though COVID's kind of put a wrench in our volunteer program, we can kind of get around that. Um, we have a couple of nurses that are veterans as well, and so they'll be assigned to that patient and be able yeah, to we can pair them up. Okay. help them out that way. Um, so yeah, the veteran program um, and then the fact that we're locally owned, we also do vigil care for our patients yes, at end of life. Um, so a lot of times we get asked, well, why don't you guys have a hospice house? Um, we just haven't ever had the need for one mm -hmm. um, because we do provide that 24 seven vigil care at end of life. And so you don't have to worry about moving your loved one to an odd place when they only have a few days left. If you don't want to, we can come in. Um, and that, it's by request, because sometimes, I know when my grandfather was passing, that was something intimate for us, and so we didn't want hospice there. Um, and we understand that and respect that, but we, that's a, a service we offer, and we volunteer our time to go do that for families that would like oh, us to be there. Wonderful. And I, especially, I would imagine, for those that it's just, the patient and maybe a spouse or, yeah. or there's mm -hmm. only one other person. Mm -hmm. Having someone like yourselves that understand that process, the, mm -hmm. the end of life process, they're available to, to walk them through that process. Mm -hmm. Be so comforting, so. Well, thank you. you. You shared a wealth of information with us today. Uh, I certainly appreciate you coming Thank you for in. having us. Yes, thank, thank you so you. much. I feel honored to be here chatting with you today. So thank you very much. Thank you. Well, um, we'll, we'll meet again and probably learn more about the hospice services that Kansas Palliative and Hospice Care serves. So thank you. Thank you.